Welcome to the Dear Doc Podcast, where we will discuss the business of running a dental practice with a panel of experts. Now, your host, Dr. Christopher Hoffpower. Hey guys, uh, welcome to another episode of the Dear Doc Podcast. Today, I am coming to you from my Studio B in Alvin, Texas. And um, I just want to, uh, to welcome my, my guest today, and that is William Blatchford. Uh, Bill, w- William, do you mind if I call you Bill? Yeah, absolutely. That's what everybody calls me. <laughs> Fantastic. So, Bill, talk to me a little bit about, um, about your, your history. Um, you're, you're a dental consultant. Uh, tell me how you got into that and um, exactly... Why should dentists listen to you? What, what makes you qualified as a, as a dental consultant? That, that's, that's, I still that's ask that question myself. Uh, <laughs> right? Well, I think that's a question that a lot of dental consultants really need to be asked because sometimes they actually have no background in dentistry. They just have some well, ideas and no really actual. Well, that's ideas. right. And, and I, you know, I, I agree with that completely. And there are, you know, in, to, in today, you know, with the internet marketing, it's really easy to become an expert real fast. Uh, it's amazing. Right. Um, so I graduated from dental school uh, 50 years ago. I uh, grew up on a dairy farm in Oregon. Uh, business was dining room table conversation at our house. Uh, my two brothers are, 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 have very large farms, uh, potatoes and wheat. Um, uh, business was always, my father had a dairy farm and a farm machinery business. And so business was always dining room table conversation. It was just, uh, I remember in college roommates would come in and say, that's just, Blatchford conversation, economics 101. And so, right. <laughs> but uh, I realized that I wanted to, I went into dentistry uh, because I wanted a better lifestyle in a dairy farm. Uh, I enjoyed science, math, I mean, all of that stuff, like all of us. But I really enjoyed it. I, I, so I practiced for 20 years, uh, Corvallis, Oregon. I built a, uh, a good sized practice in those days. Uh, you know, you want to remember in 1985, Corvallis was about 40,000 people, there were 50 general dentists. Uh, I built a I built a practice. We grossed a million dollars in 1985. Crowns were about 300. And I always had consultants. I brought my first consultant in when I was six months into practice. And I always knew that there were other people out there that knew things that I didn't know. And I've always done that, including right up until currently. As a matter of fact, I have a call today with uh, with a coach. But. Um, I started consulting because people wanted to know what I was doing. How did you get a practice that size? Mm-hmm. And you want to remember in 1985, we were not advertising. We were doing everything we could do to market. Right. I mean, we were involved in the community and our patients were referring to us, but we didn't do any overt advertising like today. Not that I was against it, just every dentist, no dentist was, was doing that. But here was a turning point. You know, we, if you look back at life and I look at inflection points, so I'm doing a million dollars. In those days, and I had two consultants at the time, and they were both telling me how great everything was and a big staff. And, and yet some months, if I had a low month, I, had, I struggled. And I remember sitting at our dining room table one day with a consultant and my wife and I, and, and my wife said, you know, if we're so great, why do we struggle some months to pay the bills? And he looked at me and said, you know, Bill's just going to have to do more dentistry. That, and that <laughs> was always the answer. It, and, that was and, always and, the answer. It, to an extent, it is now. I mean, how many times, Bill, yes. have you heard a consultant or have you heard a um, a sales rep say, "Well, Doc, that's just one more crown." That's right. I mean, there's only so many times you can say that before the whole bottom line. <laughs> well, and you know, they're still saying it, Chris. They're still saying this, and this is still a belief. And, and I'm on several of these Facebook pages, and I watch these threads. And you know, I talk to a doctor who's getting forty or fifty new patients a month. You say, "What's your biggest problem?" I need more new patients. Well, you can't even do exams on that many new patients a month. Absolutely. And, and uh, they want 60 or 80. I just talked to a doctor last week, and he's getting 60 new patients a month. And, of course, his overhead for staff is over 40%. And he, well, I said, what's your biggest problem you'd like to solve? And he said, I need more new patients. And I said, I don't think that's the question. So anyway, what happened was is that I had a good friend I had lunch with a couple times a month. He was doing 600000 and we had lunch, and we, we were very frank. We talked about numbers all the time. Turned out, in 1985, we both had exactly the same net income, 300000 
yeah. which was a good income in 85. <laughs> and it's still a good income, but in 85, that was a big income. But he was doing 600,000 and I was doing a million. So I have to do an extra 400,000 a year. That's 35,000 a month more than he's doing for the same net income. Yeah. Now, I went in the face of my consultants and it was in December. Uh, we had a Christmas party at our house. My wife asked me to count heads. We had staff, spouses, and children. 48 people for dinner. I didn't sleep that night. Part of that was we had sat out that evening in the kitchen. My wife and I are out there kind of nibbling in leftovers and cleaning up. And my wife says, you know, we do this every month. I said, what do you mean? We eat the, le- we get the, we, we let, we clean up the messes and get the leftovers. You see, at a hundred, yeah. at a million dollars in 85, if I did 85 or 90,000 a month, everything was hunky dory. But if I dropped down to 70 a month or 60, I didn't get paid. So I said, there's got to be a better way. So this is in 85. 86, I did exactly the same collections with half the team. Well, doctors were trying to find out what I was doing. So I started this, I started consulting. And this was back in the, you know, the mid 80s. And uh, I love to fly. So I thought, well, if I were a consultant, I could, I could have a bigger airplane. <laughs> so <laughs> I could justify a twin, a pressurized twin, all weather, you know. So I so I thought this would be fun. So then we had worked with uh, uh, Rick Mercer, who started the Mercer Company in, on pension funding and that sort of thing. And right. uh, we found ourselves in that position to say, not that I had enough to retire, but I knew if I kept on the same path, I would be able to. So we were able to do that. So I sold the practice and basically started doing this. So, you know, and I used to speak at every meeting in the country and I quit doing that about, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe. And, um, but we've worked on a model, Chris, and this is the important thing. It's a model of efficiency. And having said that, we have practices all over the country from our, our, our hard deck is about 600,000. And we go on up to, we have several practices in the four to 5 million range for collections, but it's based on efficiency. And it's based on keeping the staff overhead at 20%, which we know we can do because we have systems that we teach that any office can keep their staff at 20%. Well, that's, you, you take that from the average right there. There's, there's 10%. You take a million dollar practice, there's $100,000. You take that $2 million practice, it's 200. And, you know, for example, I'm, I'm talking to a doctor this week He's not a client. He'd kind of like to be a client. He's been looking at this for a couple of years and he's doing 2.4. And that's his, his 2.4 million is the number he likes to refer to. However, it's costing him 2 million to do it. Yeah. And he's working 250 days a year to do it. And, but his overhead is 2 million. And, and Bill, this is, this is one of the things that whenever I started this group and I, and I, I know that you have, uh, you've been a member of the business of dentistry for a while now. And uh, I've, I've seen some of the input you've given, which is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm interviewing you. Um, besides, I was jealous. Paul got to interview you. So I had to too, right? So I am, um, I've always held that the biggest problem that dentists have in business, other than the fact that we are not taught how to run a business mm-hmm. is, um, well, there, there's a few things there. There's the fact that we've convinced ourselves that poverty is noble, which is stupid. Um, <laughs> and uh, well, I mean, just think about it. If you want to do worldly good, you need to have money to do it. Um, you need to be able to yeah. change people's lives. Um, a- another, another problem that we have is that, um, we fall in love with the idea of gross production. Um, gross production. This. I did. This. My production I did. I want to do a million. And it, yeah. it's honestly, it's, it's, like, it's like a horse with blinders, right? And the whole reason you're, you're a farm boy, you know, I grew up on my, my grandparents' farm. It was a much smaller dairy farm than yours. Uh, or at least I spent the summers there. And, um, you know, if, if you get a horse with blinders, on, the reason you got blinders on is so he doesn't get distracted from the job he's got, mm-hmm. right? Which for us is production, production, production. But that's our dentist hat. And when we take that dentist hat off and we put on our C- a CEO hat, we need to be thinking about net. We need to be thinking about what goes into net or rather what comes out of gross production. And you are, um, you're on the program today because I, I, I'm, I'm calling this the OG week, the original gangsters of dentistry. Um, and I, I, introduced, I introduced and interviewed uh, Bruce Baird uh, yesterday. Yes. Who yeah. was also a huge influence on the way that I do things. And um, you yourself 
or a systemizer. And that's, that's how I do what I do is I systemize everything. And you are, as far as I'm concerned, one of the original gangsters of dentistry because you introduced systemic systemization. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I would say so. Uh, you know, we started out, um, you know, I, I invented block booking. And a consultant who worked with me at the time, John Oldenburg, who is no longer with us, um, he and I developed this idea of block booking because we had, and his question was very simple. Have you ever had a great day? You know, a great day, patients got good care. Uh, production was great. And it was actually invigorating. And it was, it was just a great fun day. And I said, of course. And he said, have you ever had a day, I just had two deer run by my window. Um, I, I, have you ever had a day where you wish you'd have been a, become a truck driver? Yeah. And he says, well, who scheduled both of those? And we looked at each other and says, yeah, we did. Uh, and he said, why don't you schedule all good days? And that's all block booking is, is we figure out what is a perfect day for your practice. And that's our template. Now, it's like a football team. We develop patterns we're going to run. We develop plays. Does it mean that every day is going to be perfect like that football team? No. Right. We call audibles the line of scrimmage. And that's what, I, that's what I call same day dentistry, which is an audible to line of scrimmage. But, but we have a target we're shooting for. It's simply not throwing names at the schedule and hoping it comes out. Absolutely. No, we've got a plan. And, and that was our first system we introduced. And it's been copied and bastardized by many consultants. But it's, you know, anybody can use it. I mean, I'll share it with anybody. It's so simple. And yet it seems like, it, it, you know, <laughs> it, 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 there's so much resistance at the front desk to following a plan. There is because they don't want to have discussions with patients they, and they don't want to set rules and they don't want to feel as if they're doing authoritarian. When in reality, what they're doing is their job, which is making sure that the practice produces income so that they can get paid. Yes. And, and maybe that's too much of a hard line uh, thought process, but that, that's the way I think. And I, th I think that's probably the way you think as well. Well, you know, we take a doctor and this is, and this is how we come up with our, with, our, with our daily goal. And I know there are people out there that don't even like daily goals. They think that's sacrilegious. And listen, dentistry is a profession, it's an art, and it's a business. It is a business. And, the, yes. and whether you like it or not, the first thing you have to do is you have to pay off your dental student loans. I mean, that has to be done. You have to pay off the loan on your practice. You have to pay your team. You have to pay your lab. You have to pay all of these expenses. And, you know, I, I, I will say this. One of the reasons that I went into dentistry, it makes an awfully good living. Absolutely. And I knew that. Well, there's, there's not a lot better in the world than doing something you truly love, making great money at it, and helping people exactly that's wonderful but, but you got to have three legs to that stool a two-legged stool does not stand <laughs> and, two or one you can, right you can balance really carefully i think they call a one-legged stool a pogo stick right <laughs> all right so so in this process um you realized that um you had an epiphany one day and you said if i want to have good days i should schedule good days and, and to, the, the simplicity of that is is just absolutely brilliant uh, and as as i believe most great ideas are they're utterly simple and you smack yourself in the forehead and you go why did i think of that before so exactly tell us about that moment what what it changed in your in your uh, perspective as a dentist owner whenever you realize that you were at fault for your shitty days. You know, the days where you're chasing 30 hygiene patients and you make like, oh, you know, a thousand dollars that day and you go home tired <laughs> and hating life. So and, and yeah, guys, I've had those days too. So we all had them. Talk to me. How did it change your perspective? And you know, they, I guess it gets biblical. The scales were, were shed from your eyes, right? How did it change your perspective? What, what, did you, what did you begin seeing then? Because I, I imagine oh. that once that door was open, you couldn't close it. Well, that's right. And so what, what happened here, what happened is was scheduling started working out really well. Then we started taking a look at everything we were doing in the office. And, and I asked, you know, I, I have, a, I have a, a nephew who 
actually is today a rocket scientist. He's, oh. he's, a, he, he's, he's, a, he's truly a rocket science. He, he builds, uh, at this point, he's got about 75 engineers working under him at a corporation, and they build drones for the military at this point. Oh, but fantastic. Well, who's he, he, he working with, Lockheed yeah. Martin? Or? He, what? Is, who's he working no, with, it's a group. Martin, it's, it's a name I've not remembered. He was with Raytheon for 15 years, and he just went to this company. I don't remember, but it's... Anyway, he, as a little kid, he always asked why. Why, why, why? And it drove everybody nuts. Drove my brother and sister-in-law nuts. Drove me nuts when I said, why, why? And I started listening and I said, you know, this is the question we need to ask. So we started looking at every single thing. You know, for example, we do a task analysis for every client we work with. And uh, one of the things we list every task that we do. Second column is why do we do it? And in seminars, I always say, let's, let's take a simple task like prepare and send statements. And I say, why do we do that? And Invariably, the answer comes up, some, you know, some, some, somebody in the audience raises their hands or 10 hands go up and I pick one and, oh, to get paid. And I say, no, we don't send statements to get paid. We send statements because when you were standing face to face with a patient that you knew owed you money, you, didn't. you made a conscious decision not to ask for it. Oh, Bill, we so, think very much alike. <laughs> So, so that's the first for thing example, in my head is because someone didn't do their damn job. Exactly. So a number of years ago, uh, you know, we were, I was buying an Apple computer and, you know, you select the app, the computer and they, uh, how would you like to take care of that today, Bill? And uh, you pull out your credit card, they pull out their smartphone, they swipe your card and voila, it's done. Right. And I said, bingo, we're going to put a point of sale machine in every treatment room, which we do. Hygienist finishes your hygiene visit and she says bill your fee today is two hundred dollars or two fifth whatever it is i can be your cashier oh, okay and we swipe and she you don't even have to stop at the front desk and we collect the money right there it takes two minutes and it's I, okay, done i have an argument for you uh, and i want you to convince me so i'm a big believer in they don't open the door to the treatment room to bring the patient back until the patient is paid for that day and, and then it happens as well Okay, that's I'm, right. I'm 100. percent They pay before yeah. they walk through that door, and, and you know it, best it, to estimate and, insurance, but they generally overpay on insurance. That's right. We underestimate. Yeah. Well, the office I go to in Bend is one of my clients, and that's exactly what they do. They they very very nice about it. Is I walk in, they greet me, and uh, Bill, we're you know if you want to go ahead and take care of your visit day, you can go ahead and do that. And your wife is coming in after you, so why don't you go ahead and take care of both of them at the same time? And I it's paid that. before I even sit down. It, we know what it's mind, going to be. If you don't mind, can you uh, give them a call out as, as a patient? Who, who, who is this dentist? Or, or, do, or do your obligations as a consultant? No, no I can tell you. His name is Carla Arredondo. He's in Bend. And uh, I don't know if he's on, on your program or not, but they handle it beautifully. And it's, and it's, and it's you know, it, it's not, everybody's so afraid, oh, we become, so, we're all about money. No, we're not about money. We're about service. Right. We're about service. Is Apple, you know, when you go to the Apple store, is that all about, does that seem like it's all about money? No. When you go to Nordstrom and Nordstrom is, you know, nice clothing for men, women, and children, and they've eliminated the cashier stands because the associate who brings you the clothing pulls out their smartphone and you pay right there. It's not about okay. money. It's okay, about so good Bill, service. You've put your finger, like I said, as with all things, truly brilliant ideas are very simple. And you put your finger right there on the problem. The lady who walks up to you with your goods at Nordstrom or the associate who walks up to you and helps you at the Apple store, they truly believe that what they do has value. Exactly. And as dentists and our dental teams, they get it from us, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. We set a poor example because we don't truly believe that the thing that we're doing has value or at least has the value that we're charging for. We feel guilty making a profit. And that's, that's my point about poverty is not noble. You know, I tell you a funny story. <laughs> I tell this story, you know, in our program, we, we put on, um, our program's 18 months long and we have, we put on two seminars during that period of time for the doctor and the staff. And we're very excited right now. Uh, the first one to be digital, uh, virtual will be May 14th and 15th. We're doing the whole thing virtually and we're really getting excited about doing it. We're doing, we've got a dress rehearsal coming up and it's, it's going to be really great. But you know, part of that thing is this guilt feeling about what we, what we make. And uh, when I was practicing dentistry, I was in a college town and 
I, I played tennis a couple times a week. And one of my tennis partners was a college professor. And he was a patient in my practice. And one day he came into the office and he was kind of joking around. He was a top business administration. He'd had, he had a PhD and he was teaching business administration over the campus. He'd never, mm -hmm. he'd never been in business himself. He'd never met a payroll. He knew nothing about business. <laughs> what he was teaching him. Anyway, so, so he's complaining about what I make. And uh, his name was Pat. And uh, I said, Pat, you and I went to college about the same time, right? He said, yeah. Yeah, I think we're just a year apart in graduation. And I said, when you were in college, did you know that dentists made more money than college professors? He said, yes. I said, so did I. And, and he said, touche, and sat down, and then we never discussed fees again. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that. I knew me. I'd make more than a college <laughs> professor. I'm not I, I embarrassed. Wish I, I wish I had one of the little green screen editions I could actually keep a tally up here. I'd give you a point on that one. <laughs> but you know what? I tell that story, and people, would you really say that to a patient? I said, of course I would. Absolutely. I mean, I remember my family dentist when, when I was getting ready to go to dental school, and, and he said, now don't. He said, when you go in for your interview, don't be afraid to say that you're, you'd like to make a nice living. He said, if you don't say it, they know you're lying anyway. He said, why did you choose dentistry? And I said, real simple. I grew up on a farm. I didn't want to work seven days a week. I also noticed that dentists made a really nice living. Absolutely. <laughs> and they said, okay. <laughs> so, so, again, so the other thing I think, first off, I think, so let's take that doctor again that's doing 2.4 million. Let's just say we come back, we get the green flag, and we go back to work. Um, what if he does, so his big concern is, well, what's going to happen if, if my production drops? And I says, you know, let's plan on it. Mm -hmm. I said, you're taking home right now 400000 out of $2.4 million. What if we dropped the gross to $2 million, but we dropped the overhead to 50%? Now, I've looked at his P&L, and I know I can do that. I can do that within 90 days. I can probably do it in 30 days if he's willing to act on it. But, right. but the point is this. Would you rather have 50% of $2 million or 20% of 2.4? You know, I mean, yeah. it, it's, it's silly. And yet he's working way over 200 days a year. And our typical doctor doing 2 million is probably doing about 140, 150 days a year. Yep. And, and that's part of my system too, is when I work, I work. And then and I play. You play, you play. And see, I took August off every year when I was practicing dentistry. I took August off. We had a little sailboat, and we would take our, my wife and our two daughters, and we'd go up in the San Juan Islands and spend a month on the sailboat every summer. Nice. And people say, how'd you do that? And I said, again, hey, Chris, it's so simple. It's, this is the secret. Your, your guys listening to this should write this down. Don't make any appointments in August. And then the hygienist, what, well, what about hygiene? I'll say, let me say this one more time. Don't make hygiene appointments in August. And they, oh. <laughs> yep. And so, anyway, so the other thing I think is going to have to change. First off, they're going to become much more efficient. And every time right. we have one of these disasters, like floods or hurricanes or forest fires or and earthquakes. Now, now, hold on. You and I had a conversation before we came on. And I, I'm going to bring you back to this thought. But, um, Bill, you have the unique position of having been through even more of these than I have. You know, I've, I've been through um, so many recessions, I can't shake a stick at it. I called this one um, back in September. Uh, we were going to be in a recession no matter what, just because of the yes. way that the market was behaving. Mm -hmm. and, um, and for those of you who doubted me and said I was an idiot, you're welcome. But um, with that aside, you've been through a lot of different disasters. You've been through a lot of these upheavals. Now, granted, there's never been anything quite like this before, um, but... You learn something, and that's no matter what stripe of disaster it is, the response is very, very similar. So talk to us a little bit about all the things that you've been through that give you the unique ability to offer perspective in today's current situation. Well, you know, to start with, if we go back, and of course, I, I, I've been consulting for 39 years. That's probably, you were, you were, you were a little boy when I started doing this. And uh, but, you know, in, 19, in the eight, early 80s, you want to remember, interest rates were 20, 21%. Being a dentist, I had a 10-year lease when I started in 1970, and I'm going to build an office. And I've always said that, you know, dentists build buildings when they want them. Not when the market's right, but when they want them. So I built a, I built a new dental office in 1980. Interest rates were 20%. Are you kidding me? 
<laughs> but I didn't care. I'm gonna. I want a new I'm getting, office. Stomach so lining is, is is just ripping off of me right now, thinking about the twenty percent interest rates. But yeah, oh, yeah. I, I I do remember. And and hey, thanks, Jimmy, Jimmy Quarter. Shout out to you, buddy. Yes. Yeah. And so then, so we got through that one. Then we had the gas, cr the gas crunch. We had all of these different things we went through. But I want to, I want to just bring this into perspective. Let's take a flood, which some of you in your area have experienced. Absolutely, Harvey. And, and some and have lost others. several floods. You lose your life. You lose your office, and some lost their homes. Uh, we've had we had an earthquake uh, in uh, Los Angeles where one of our clients actually lost his. Uh, lost his entire office, couldn't even, he had paper charts at the time, he couldn't even go back and get his charts. His practice is gone. Um, okay. We've had forest fires where doctors have lost their office and their home at the same time. So when you localize this, it's exactly the same disaster. We've had, we're doing a webinar next week, we're doing one Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and, and one of our clients next week is talking about the fact that he was in a car accident in Seattle, he's from upstate New York, and he was out at John Coyce's program, had a car accident, in a limo on the way to the airport, and, and terrible accident, punctured a lung, did all kinds of things. He couldn't even, he couldn't fly. He had to take the train back to New York after a month in the hospital in Seattle. He was out for three to four months and he, and he did just fine. But what he's going to share is why he was able to survive that disaster. Number one, he has a practice operating very efficiently and he had cash reserves to last for enough, long enough. He'd paid off debt, he'd paid off all his debt, including his house, his house mortgage and everything. So his expenses are low. So one of the things besides being efficient is to create a cash reserve. Now we've got clients, I spoke to, we're speaking to a lot of our clients. I mean, we're literally, during this crisis, we are, we're a small company. We're, we're very small. There are three of us. Uh, my daughter, who's a dentist, owns the business now. She, another dentist who developed essential tremors and had to quit, who was a client, uh, and myself are the coaches. We have three consultants who've all been with me for 20 years. So we're a pretty uh, uh, mature group, as you say. And, uh, but we're talking to these clients every day. And this one doctor, now in Oregon, we're out till June 15th. His biggest fear is our governor will let us go back to work sooner. He says, Bill, I don't want to go back to work sooner. I've got enough money to go through this. It's no big deal. Right. Um, and, and thanks to you. And he does, his practice does about $4 million, but it does it at a very low overhead. And he said, I've got plenty of cash. I don't have any bills. And he's a young man. He's, he just turned 40. And, uh, but, he said, but that's what gets us through these things. Absolutely. The next thing that I think is important, Chris, and this, is going to be, and this is what you talked about. Dentists and their staffs have to learn how to communicate value to their patients in a much better way because it's so much easier. And I'll use the word sell, which I've always used, mm -hmm. to sell to your existing clients than it is to get new clients in the door. Absolutely. And well, yet, they're low hanging fruit. They're there. You've already impressed upon them who you are and yes. what you're about. You don't, have to, you don't have to get that first date thing going on, right? You know, they say, they say that sales is 90% relationship. Yeah. If you and I like each other, we'll do business together. We'll work out the details. And, and yet, it seems like the common thing that everybody wants, well, I need more new patients but you're ignoring the ones over here. So I say, learn new skills, learn how to do complete treatment, you know, go through some comprehensive courses, learn how to do implant surgery, learn how to do these different things, and work with your existing patients and learn to communicate value. And that's, we spend, we spend half the time in our program teaching teams how to communicate that value of ideal treatment and be, and you do it by listening to the patient. What does the patient want? Not what you want. What does the patient want? See, my philosophy is nobody needs any dentistry. And I'm not being sarcastic. I'm, I'm very sincere. No one even needs teeth. And you and I both know people who have lived long, useful lives without teeth. So I want to find out what that patient wants. And when they say, hey, doc, what do I really need? You don't need anything. You don't even need teeth. Let me tell you about my grandparents. And my team members would roll their eyes at that point because they heard the story. So all, my, all four of my, my grandparents were identical as early in life. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you, you, and, and you communicate a couple of things there. And I don't know um, if everyone is picking up on those. I've had, I've had a lot of communication training. And um, what you did there um, was linking. You found a commonality with your patient. You're relating mm -hmm. your story, a personal story, 
to them. And then you're inviting them to tell you their personal story. Their story. That's right. And, <laughs> and that's part of it. It's, 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 and it's easy for some of us. But we have to remember, Bill, you grew up on a farm, right? And you grew up that's working correct. your tail off. And you finally went to school when you could afford to go and, and, and what, what have you. You know, I, I grew up, I didn't go to dental school um, until 2008. And to give you an idea, I'm, I'm 26 now. Uh, 26, 46 now. Boy, I just, <laughs> I just got younger and skinnier. That's great. So um, I have had innumerable jobs and, and professions before becoming a dentist. And so I knew how to converse with people. I knew how to talk with people who weren't my, my colleagues. Most mm -hmm. of the kids today have gone to elementary school and then they've gone to middle school and then they've gone to high school and then they went to dental school and then they got out and they're this figure of authority to most of the population. They're a mm -hmm. doctor, mm -hmm. right? But they've never held a real job and they've never had to talk to anyone who wasn't already in their predicament going through school. Yeah. They have no experience outside of that. And so this is not a skill that most people develop anymore whenever they go into professional schools. And, and, and that's, it's, it's a common thing in MDs, veterinarians, optometrists, dentists. But what are your thoughts on that? Do you agree or disagree, first of all? And, and, I, I agree. I agree completely. I agree completely. Um, you know, Avram King, who was an early um, dental philosopher, I'll call him, uh, he made the statement one time that if a dentist becomes successful in private practice, an admissions committee probably made a mistake. In other words, the characteristics that make us successful in private practice are not the characters, characteristics the admissions committees are looking for. Right. And what they're looking for is a 4.0 and, and, and ace the, the DAPT. And that does not at all indicate how a dentist will relate to patients. And, and that's a huge mistake. And I agree with you completely. Uh, you take um, uh, as students, you know, as students, so you go back as far as even in high school, in grade school, junior high, I didn't, you know, I went to a four room grade school with two grades in every room, but who do you hang with? Well, you tend to hang with the kids that think the way you do. Right. And the same thing through high school, you know, you belong to the groups that think like you do and you go to college, now you're starting to wean that into a more, and you're now with, you know, you're all with the science students, and, you know, and then you go to dental school, and now you're there with, got the best grades through the science courses in university, and we're all exactly the same, as far as, and so, and you're right, you, you know, my team used to say to me, you know, Bill, you can, you can talk to anybody. You can talk to the nuclear physicist from the university in one room, pop over here in the next room and talk to the slogger and talk to all of them. And I says, well, really, how do I do that? And they said, well, they say, how do you know all this stuff? And I said, well, listen to my conversation. Here's my conversation. You're a nuclear physicist. Wow. You must be smart. How'd you get into that? Mm -hmm. How long you've been doing that? What do you do out there at that reactor? Wow. That's really amazing. Could I come out sometime and kind of watch what you guys are doing? Now I go into the next room and I talk to the logger. Wow. How'd you become a logger? <laughs> what particular job do you do? <laughs> Could I bring my kids out and watch one of your operations someday? And they say, oh, you just ask questions, don't you? Right. <laughs> and, that's, and that's really the key to, in communications like you're doing today is, and I'm, I'm talking a lot today because you're asking the questions, but truly with patients, you have to learn to ask questions and you don't need to know anything. As a matter of fact, knowing something is probably a detriment. <laughs> You know, there's, there's one other trick that I use um, that I find complica uh, complements that technique. And that is what I call the nine degrees to Kevin Bacon. Yes. And as you already know where I'm going. Really? I know where you know, you're going. I used to do such and such. I remember you guys were, or, you know, I used, and you establish a commonality between you, even if it's not a direct link. And all of a mm -hmm. sudden you're a trusted advisor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, think, I, I think everyone should learn the first thing is you're, and, and, and again, please, you have far more experience than I do. I, 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 my, my, my experiences have been success in my own business, but not necessarily success in other people's businesses and your, yours has. Mm -hmm. So when I enter a room, the first thing is my assistant always introduces me. If it's a yes. new patient, if it's an old patient, it doesn't matter. Hey, and this is Dr. Huff Power. And if it's a, an old patient, I'll say, 
yeah, we already know each other. How are you been, have you been doing? Yep. But it has to happen every time because that's a system. If it doesn't happen, you know, I'll, time, I'll you tell you something, Chris. What's that? Chris, what we did in my office. Here's a system. Here's another system. So when I walked into hygiene, then we'll talk about hygiene because that was, we're talking about recall patients for exactly. Now we had a system that when we, when I walked in and, the, and part of the thing was, is I can come in at any time. I'm not going to, I wanted to eliminate, you know, the uh, hygienist standing. Yeah, yeah thank yeah. you. Okay. I, I, I had to have my moment of celebration to hear that from somebody else. The, the, the hygienist is there at my pleasure. When I'm ready right. to see my patient, I'm going to see my patient. Right. I don't care if you're probing teeth. That's correct. Uh, that's right. And I, and I, I want to eliminate, and, and for hygienists too, I want to eliminate the hygienist standing in the operatory of the doctor trying to get their attention to come see my patient. Look, I can come in at the beginning, the middle, the end. It makes no difference. I'm not there to check on the hygiene. I'm not looking for a piece of calculus they missed. I'm not a dental school examiner. I'm, a, I'm, I'm there with the patient. So I would walk into the, into the room. And when I walk into the room, it was almost like officer on the deck. The hygienist would stand up, tip the patient up in the chair, and we even had a piece of masking tape on the floor that showed exactly where I want the chair, where I'm going to sit. I'm going to walk in. She is going to hold the chart up, and of course we had paper charts, and with large felt tip, we had the patient's name across the chart, the name they preferred to be called. And the script was this. Dr. B, of course you remember Joe Smith. Oh yeah, Joe and I are in Rotary together, of course. But the next time Joe comes in, Dr. B, of course you remember Joe Smith. Now people think that's silly, but you know, I can't even depend on the, on the schedule on the computer or post it in the hallway. Maybe we change patients. I will, hey Frank, how are you? Yeah. Oh, it's Joe. <laughs> and it was so simple, but it was a system and we did it every single time. Mm -hmm. And when I walk into the treatment room with a patient, it was exactly the same thing with the assistant. They were standing, they would hold the patient's chart up, and of course you remember, or Bill, I'd like to introduce you to for a new patient. Mm -hmm. But it was a system. It wasn't, it wasn't left to chance that I can remember who this patient is. Absolutely. So and we've had the following conversation. What do you think, Doc? Oh, yeah, that'd be a great thing to do. What do you think? And, 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 my, and all I was doing, and they could, you know, you know, legally they couldn't prescribe treatment, of course, right. but we're getting some shadows here, I can see. Uh, yeah, we could, my, my window's doing the same thing. I, I didn't block it off because uh, I usually conduct my interviews in the other studio and it, it doesn't have a window facing the sun. I, my apologies. Yeah, the sun is coming up out there. It's good. But, but you see, it was a system and, and they could talk about treatment. Dr. B will probably recommend the following because we had thoroughly discussed my standard of treatment, standard of care. And so they could confidently say, Wait a minute, so you're saying it wasn't some mysterious thing that you as the doctor had to hold tight to your chest? I, that's, Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something, and I'm going to get a lot of hate on this one. Well, if we don't one say day, something controversial, we've been no value. <laughs> right. You know, one, one of these days, dentists are going to wake up and realize that we don't have a special skill set in our hands. We have a special skill set in our minds. Mm -hmm. And dentists freak out about expanded duty hygiene. And in Texas, oh, my God, they can't give shots because they might kill someone, which I've never, never heard of a single case of that happening. But, you know, hey, they're taught that in dental school, so that's great. Let's yeah. do evidence-based stuff. Whenever it comes to a dental hygienist drilling on teeth, they lose their damn minds. Here's the deal. Every dentist has made a mistake, every single one of us. Yeah. And if you haven't, you don't do a damn thing. The second thing is that there is no special skill in your hands that anyone else can't replicate. That's right. There are athletes out there who can do things with their bodies that you could not even dream of doing. The special skill that you have lies here. And until you communicate the stuff that's in here with your team and with your patients, you are failing as a doctor. Yeah, that's right. No, you're, you're, you nailed it. And, and, and I think that so many doctors, you know, I talk to staff members and, and, you know, a hygienist in particular, and they'll, they'll suggest some treatment and the doctor will come in just to prove that he's the doctor or she's the doctor. Well, just, say, no, no, we'll, we'll disagree with them. And, and I said, that's a really good way to prevent, make sure that that hygienist will never Absolutely. make recommendations again. Just do it, it a way, couple it, times. If your hygienist is wrong, here's the way you deal with it. You know, let me take a look at that. You know, I can see why you said that. That's a uh -huh. really good recommendation. I, I'll tell you what, though, I really think we have 
maybe another year before we'll have to do that. Or, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I think maybe there's a little bit too much of the tooth missing. I think we're going to have to do a crown instead of a filling. Yeah. But I mean, it's, like, it's so, so simple. That up. Make the other person right. But I think that, exactly. you know, between the efficiency and learning to communicate better, and I, this is what I see working right now, because, you know, we're working, we're, as I say, we're a relatively small company. We have about 200 clients in a given time. And, and the ones who are really doing well have been with us for a number of years. And, and they are, you know, they've got the cash reserves and they're just enjoying the time with their family. And then the new doctors we're talking to right now, uh, you know, I, I've been doing, we, we bring a new client in, we, we call it a summit and I spend six hours with them. I still do that part. I love that part. And, uh, and, and uh, we find out where they want to go 20 years from now, what's their lifestyle they want. And then we design a practice to an ideal practice. And I keep them on a the track of, no, don't tell me what you're doing now. Tell me what you want. No, that's what you're, that's what you're doing now. Tell me what you're, where we're going, what we want. And then let's look, then we figure that out and get real clear on that. And then we take a look at what we have to work with. Uh, and then we re start to re-engineer it. And, you know, for net income, for example, we'll start with the bottom line. What would you like to earn? Okay, let's figure out the easiest way to do that as opposed to, you know, taking everything we have now. So then I think the third thing that doctors are going to have to do is we are going to have to, as a profession, we've been dealt a bad hand here by mandatory closure of dental offices. My personal physician is still operating. My dermatologist is still operating their offices. Uh, chiropractors here in Bend are still seeing patients. But for some reason, dentistry was singled out that we have to close. Now, it is true that we, most, a lot of our procedures, we create this aerosol, but I think we're gonna have to do a better job or come up with a good story of how safe we really are. And let's go back. In the 80s, before you were even in high school, we had the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. Now, you have, if AIDS at that time was 100% fatal, I mean, it had a 100% mortality rate. If you, if you developed AIDS, you were, uh, you know, you were, uh, it was a death sentence. And yet we were mandated. We were, it was mandatory that we treat HIV patients. We, we, HIV positive, we could not discriminate, we had to turn them down, it, we, which, you know, it, and we had to do different things. We double gloved, we had to wear gowns with cuffs on them and face masks and, and various things. But we developed that, th that we did. And we're gonna have to do a good PR job when we get the green flag to let people know what we're doing to keep them safe and keep our team safe. And we may have to change some things that, that we're doing in dental offices. It, I, I'd know, suggest it's a, a rebranding of our messaging too, because yeah. a lot of us right now, we, we, you're gonna need to let the patients know it's okay and that they can be comfortable and safe in your practice. Those are yes. gonna be huge things, uh, more so even than we usually do with our anxious patients. No, it's, it, and what we're doing right now, and I'll tell you this to the people that are listening to this, we're recommending to our clients to put together a, a, a good short little video, either Facebook Live or Zoom. Just get the message out to your current clients, what you're doing during this time, and let them know that you're thinking about them, that you're thinking about their safety. You know, just be in touch with them. We've had several of our clients put together some, uh, you know, some are, some are kind of serious and some are a little lighter, but they're we've recommended they really work at staying in touch with their patients during this closure. Uh, it's so important. Remember, relationship is part of it. And as, as their dentist, you want to be, uh, they want to see what you're doing, what's going on in your practice. So we're recommending uh, start the messaging now and how you're really work, looking at how you're going to change what you're doing. I think we're going to see some changes. Um, you know, I, I started practicing. I, I drew blood in a hospital for a year. We didn't wear gloves. You know, I, <laughs> it was just, we didn't do that. And when I started practicing, we didn't wear gloves. We didn't wear face masks. We didn't, you know, we didn't do any of those things. And, uh, you, you know, in the dental school clinic, uh, I had a job there and I mixed the, uh, the cold sterile uh, solution once a week, the janitor would come get me and I'd go up the third floor and we'd mix it in a 55 gallon drum. And, and we carried these little glass containers around and all of our instruments that we used were just cold sterile. And then of course we switched mm -hmm. to autoclaving everything. And, and you know, things change as we go along. And I think this will bring about 
some changes also, but I think the dentist and the team are going to be, have to get on the same page. Uh, you know, your, your team can't be saying, oh yeah, you're going to catch uh, COVID-19 in our practice. You, you, you've got to be careful. I mean, you've got to develop some stories here uh, of what we're doing. So those three things, the efficiency, uh, the sales skills will, and I, you know, people criticize me for calling using the word sale. I mean, you know, when I used to speak all the time, people would say, Bill, we really like your message, but don't use the, the sale word. Don't use that word. Until you, know? you tell your truth, yourself a tr the truth, some serious truths as a business owner, then you're, you can't truly be successful. You, yeah. you need to admit to yourself that you're selling things. And in, in many well, cases, I am. And, things and, and what I'm doing, Chris, is, is, see, I want all my patients to have the best treatment possible. I want the treat patients to have the best treatment possible. You know, and, and I say, use, so use you your story. In an ethical manner, <laughs> right? I, you know? I'm going to pull my blind here for just a please, moment. Please. And, and Bill, say, say hi to the missus. I saw her sneak past a little while ago. Oh, yeah. She's, Carolyn is here. Carolyn and I have been married for, we, we celebrate our 53rd wedding anniversary this year. That's and uh, and there's and I've told her every day there's nobody I'd rather be quarantined with, and uh, we are. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a special moment of 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 a, of, of a, a pinnacle of a relationship where you reach the point where you've been together longer than you ever were alone by yourself. Well, the, we passed that a long time ago. <laughs> so, so I'm going to ask you a couple of hard questions and some things I think people need to know and need to hear. Um, the first thing. Um, We'll go with the easier of the two. Whenever you're looking at the recovery from this event, um, there are people who are saying, hey, um, we should be going out of network. There are people who are saying, hey, being in network is going to be more important than ever. Where do you stand on that, Bill? You know, I'll tell you, this, this, uh, prior to this event happening, we were saying, you know, our theme for 2020 is going to get people out of network. Here's a question I ask. Corporations have all lost a lot of money during this. I mean, most corporations have. And if they're going to look at their bottom line, I think there may be a lot of corporations dropping dental insurance. No one going to work. No one coming. I we got 6 million people unemployed right now. When these people go back to work, do you think they're going to take a job and they're going to say, hmm, do you offer dental insurance here? Right. I don't think that's a factor. And corporations are you know, they're whatever, however you want to look at them, but they're interested in the bottom line, taking care of the stockholders. And, and they may, there may be a lot of corporations that drop dental insurance. Now, we have been helping doctors for years become fee-for-service. I mean, that's been one of our f flags that we fly is, how do you become fee-for-service? And, and the thing that you do, and by the way, we call it unrestricted. We're an unrestricted <laughs> office. I love that. I well, really think about it. Well, I mean, this is, this is all part of it. How do you say it? Do you say we're strictly a cash practice, which drives people away, right. or we're an unrestricted office? We, we say that we're a premier provider and we'll gladly file your insurance for you. Yeah, exactly. And so we say we're an unrestricted provider, which means that we don't, we don't have to follow the guidelines developed by the insurance company's accountants. We're gonna prescribe for you what we think is the best treatment for you, and you will deal with us and we will we'll help you bill your insurance we will help you maximize your insurance but our relationship is with you not your insurance company and when the team gets on board you know actually one of the one of the largest practices i have and we have clients all over uh, you know all over the united states every corner of the united states we have clients and for a period of time i had i helped a lot of doctors in in the uk come out of the nationalized healthcare. I was going over to England every other month for a while. And, uh, but one of our largest practice here in Oregon is in a town, about 25,000 people. It's on the Oregon coast. Uh, it's got one of the highest unemployment rates, uh, one of the lowest per capita incomes. He does about five and a half million. And his, his story is, you know, no, I, I don't, uh, I'm an unrestricted office. Everybody pays the same here, just like the grocery store doesn't matter who your insurance is. It's just like the grocery store. You all pay the same. And, and you know what? And, and that's, we've had clients do this. And I think coming out of this, I think it's an excellent time to do it. I think it's an excellent time to consider going fee for service. But the whole team has to be on board. 
No, we we that's we talk. That's hard. That's hard. A lot well, of these... uh, sorry, Bo. Go ahead. We we have a term that we use, and it's something my wife and I started talking about fifty some years ago. Even before we got married, we started talking about the fact that. Carolyn comes from a family of five. I have, I have, there are three of us in our family, three brothers. And we said, our life is going to be different. Not better, worse, just different. We started talking about this and we started developing this idea that everybody's in a comfort zone. Um, and so then, and, and it's going to be a different life. We're going to travel. We're going to enjoy life. Anyway, then I hired a psychiatrist with four other dentists a couple of years out of dental school to study how people make decisions. This was an interesting thing. Let's make the story short. First session, we met with him for all afternoon and evening. It was going to be for three months, twice a month for three months. Well, it went on for two years. And we st the first thing he started to talk to us about was a thing called deserve level. We, you know, we live in this comfort zone that has a, a floor and a ceiling. If we go through the floor, and this affects everything in our life, whether it be our physical fitness, our relationship, the money in the bank, the car we drive, the clothes we wear, it just goes on and on and on. If we drop below the floor, we do something about it. Money in the bank account. It goes below the floor, we stop writing checks, we put more money in. But here's the scary thing. If we go above the ceiling, we sabotage ourselves to get back down where we're comfortable. Evidence. Professional athletes sign the multi-million dollar contract. Now, you would think they're set for life, but what happens in the average, I've seen statistics on this, the average NFL player is dead broke in five years once they leave the league. Absolutely. NBA is seven years, and we can go on and on with this. And the reason is, Chris, this is so interesting. They couldn't stand to have money. It was out of their comfort zone. Yeah. So what do they do when they get money? They blow it. They blow it as fast as they can to get rid of it so they're back down in their comfort zone. Now. This is something we study with dentists and dental staffs. Where is their comfort zone? What is their deserve level? And, and the danger of this deserve level is we inflict it on our patients with a treatment plan. Mm -hmm. And our deserve level tells us patients won't pay full fee <laughs> for dental work because it's out of our comfort zone. So psychiatrists tell us we can't change that, but they also tell us we can become aware of it. And so I tell my clients all the time, when you become aware of this, just realize you're breaking your comfort zone. Don't sabotage yourself. You put money in the bank. You keep it. And you keep it there. Well, and not necessarily in the bank, but you know what I mean, in savings. And it's okay. That's, oh, it's out of my comfort zone. I should spend it and get, I shouldn't have money. Or I shouldn't prescribe ideal treatment. Or they shouldn't have ideal treatment themselves. So it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating study. Um, but dentists and teams are going to have to get through that. So if you want to become fee for service, it, it's a, it's a process. It is. It is. And I, I would, I would say for, for me, it required a year to a year and a half of conversations with patients to explain to them why their insurance was not treating them in a way that was beneficial to them, but rather beneficial That's to the insurance company. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that a lot of people don't really realize that not just, not just, patients, but also doctors as well. They've never wrapped their mind around the, the perfect patient for an insurance company is someone who has one tooth and, and no periodontal disease uh, because they don't, they want the smallest number of risk and each right. one of your teeth is a risk that they're insuring. So the fewer teeth that you have, the better their business plan is. And That's right. That they don't re decrease their premiums as you lose those risks. They stay the same. It is the most insane business model I've ever seen. It's the only business I know of that is predicated upon the ideal that they're going to, pardon my language, Bill, you're such a genteel gentleman. They're going to fuck every single customer they have. That's, right. That's their whole business plan. Yeah. They're going to fuck well, everyone I, they do I business said with. This. The dentist, the patients, everyone. I've said this, Chris. If you were to put a dozen MBAs in a, in a, a boardroom, think tank, situation and let's design the perfect business the perfect business model it would be a dental insurance company yeah. because what we're going to do we're going to collect premiums from the employers and then we're going to convince a group of dentists to provide their services at a discount and then we're going to restrict what they can do 
we're going to pay out as little as possible. <laughs> It'd be the perfect business. Absolutely. And you're absolutely correct. And, we'll put a, and we, we're going to cut our losses. We're going to put a yearly maximum on what they can do. It doesn't matter what they need. We're going to put a yearly maximum on what they can do. And then we're going to keep lowering their fees. Here's something to think about. In 1970, there was no dental insurance to speak of. On the West Coast, the longshoremen and the grocery clerks got it. You know what the fees they offered at that time for us to join their programs were higher than our usual and customary? And the average overhead in a dental practice was 45%. 30, 40 years later, the average overhead had gone to 75%, and that was only due to one thing. That was due to the insurance companies controlling the fees. So the net income was cut in half. So following that model, the dentist had to see twice as many patients to make the same net income. Absolutely. So um, it's like the, fr the frog in the boiling water. I, I've, got a, um, I've, I've got one more question for you to, uh, to talk about. And then I'm going to have to let you go because um, someone's here to pick up one of my kids. So, okay. Um, what percentage of dental offices, historically speaking, are not going to make it out of this recession? Well, there are going to be a few, and it's going to be regional. It's, it's going to be regional. There will be some regions that aren't even touched, and there will be regions where uh, they won't make it, and we can predict where they're going to be. They're going to be in the urban areas where there's an abundance of dentists, where it's really competitive. Those areas we're going to see probably, as a matter of fact, we're doing, I'm doing a webinar today at 9 o'clock for our clients on the opportunity coming out of this, and the opportunity coming out is to purchase the patient base in those practices and merge them. And I'm going to say, Probably, you know, in some areas, it may be 20%. Or you take I, a real actually, 20% is the number I came to as well. Just looking historically, um, I, I think it's going to be between 15 and 25%. So I, I, yeah. I average it at 20 I, I think so. You know, the predictions in, in, in business in general, in the restaurant business, they figure it'll be at least 50%. At least 50% of restaurants will go out of business during this time. But that's a much riskier, low return business than we are. We're right. a much got a much better return. So I think probably, I think 15 to 20 is probably realistic. And if you're operating marginally and high overhead, it's, it may be over. Well, Chris, could I mention something? I've, I've got a, a, a website that they might want to look at. It's, it's blatchford.com fantastic forward slash system dash webinar. And if they'll look at that, we have a systems analyzer they can go to and download it and do it. And is, there's no obligation, nothing to it from us. Just, I just want dentists to become more efficient. And you know, more importantly, I want dentists and team members to enjoy their life. I mean, that's, that's a bottom line for us. Well, Bill, thank you for giving us an hour of your time today. And I, I, I doubt this will be the last time that we have you on the podcast. I, I've found the, the, the conversation very, very interesting, stimulating and enjoyable. So. Thank you for everything you're doing. You're doing a great job for dentistry. And uh, there are a lot of followers out there that you have that you don't even know about. So you're doing a great job. Thanks, Bill. Hey, folks, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of the Dear Doc podcast. And uh, yeah, you may have wasted an hour of your time listening to the sound of my voice droning on, or hopefully you took something away from this that'll make your practice better and um, your life a little bit happier. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to the Dear Doc Podcast, your source for the business and legal questions associated with your dental practice. Don't forget to subscribe to the Dear Doc Podcast on all major platforms.